This is very exciting. Hi, I'm Dale Peterson, and this is the Unsolicited Response Show. I hope everyone in the U.S. had a great Thanksgiving, and now we're in the sprint to the year's end. Always a busy time for people in this industry. Just a quick note before my interview with Andrew Ginter. This week, actually today, Monday, the Monday after Thanksgiving, we hit ticket number 735 for S4X24. Tickets go up, ticket prices go up at ticket number 751. So if you want to save a little bit of money and know you're coming to S4, I would encourage you to get your ticket almost immediately. After that, the price stays the same from ticket number 751 to ticket number 1100. We are well ahead of last year's rate. So I would expect a sellout sometime in January. If you know you're coming, don't wait too long. It is a sellout. We uh, we do not have an opportunity to have 1,200 people or 1,300 people. When we hit 1,100, we have to stop selling tickets. And now here's my interview with Andrew Ginter. So with that, uh, Liz, let's bring up our guest. Our guest for this episode is Andrew Ginter. He is the VP of Industrial Security for Waterfall Security Solutions. And uh, more appropriately for this conversation, Andrew just completed his first book this year. He is the author of Engineering Grade OT Security. So welcome to the podcast, Andrew. Thank you so much. It's my first book this year, but it's my third book um, career-wise. Yes, exactly. Um, and so in your third book, you've had two cracks at it. Um, you wanted to write more on a related topic. They're all, it's almost like a series of books you can read. Who did you write this book for? Who's your ideal target reader? Who were you thinking about when you wrote it? Um, well, the subtitle is A Manager's Guide. And so, um, you know, I was thinking about uh, all of the people that, that uh, you know, I talked to about, you know, were kind enough to give me feedback on the first two books. Mm -hmm. Um, the technical people sort of got the first two books. The feedback I got, uh, you know, on the first two books was, I'm sorry, the second one was really technical. A lot of people just couldn't get through it. The, uh, the first one, the chapters they liked the most were sort of chapters one and two. A lot of people never got past chapter two. Um, and these were the, the chapters where I introduced stuff. And so I was thinking, uh, you know, I was at the time I was thinking I, I want to target people who are making decisions about um, how much money to spend, basically, how how much security to do. I wanted to motivate people to do OT security and I wanted to give them guidance as to, uh, you know, how to justify the spend uh, and how to decide how much spend was was enough. So, you know. I thought managers, I thought especially IT people who are increasingly responsible for the budgets, even on the OT side. Um, and, you know, OT managers who used to be engineers 30 years ago and sort of need to come into the modern era. The feedback that I've got since the book came out is sort of that it, in a sense, is more useful to the, uh, the IT managers coming in with budget they tend to have uh, more to learn about the OT space. Um, but still, uh, you know, if the, the, uh, the, the, end, the former engineers who are now business decision makers, um, you know, if they skip a couple of chapters at the beginning and, you know, sort of get to the meat in chapters four, five, and six, um, you know, and I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. Well, it was funny. I thought one of the, you know, I've known you for a long time. One of the most interesting parts of the book was at the very end where you kind of got a little personal about why you wrote the book and such. And you, you said that uh, you spent a long time writing it and then throwing it out and starting again from scratch twice, which is really a huge effort. And um, you said, I have to adopt, I tr have tried to adopt not a critical voice, not a documentary voice, but a prescriptive one. Do this do that for this reason. Time will tell how this effort is received. So you've had a, a few months. How has it been received? Are people saying you have given me this prescriptive journey to take or actions to take? Are, are you seeing that uh, as one of the goals that you were hoping for actually 
be realized? That was the goal. So let me start at the beginning. Um, the uh, what you saw a uh, a preview, um, yep. and it's actually been rearranged a bit in the uh, the first printing. What was the epilogue? I've made the prologue. So that section of the book is now the very first thing that you see. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, to your question uh, about feedback. Um, most people haven't made it into the really prescriptive bits. I mean, the you know, chapter two is a description of the OT security problem. Chapter three is a description of the IT security threat landscape and how it applies to OT. You know, chapter four is an introduction to engineering grade protections and cyber informed engineering and that whole space. Uh, you know, chapter five is another introduction. I don't get to the prescriptive bits until seven and eight. And I've had very little feedback from anyone who's read that far. I very much welcome that when it gets to me. Um, but, you know, the reason that I took the, the prescriptive tone is also in the prologue, but it's basically the feedback I got on, on the first book, in part from you, Dale. I mean, I quote you in the book. I don't know if you remember giving me that feedback. But back in the day, you know, you looked at the Red Book and said, Andrew, I disagree so fundamentally with your premise that I could not finish reading this thing. I saw that. I saw that quote. I thought that was that sounded like me. <laughs> yes. yes, indeed. Um, and, you know, I uh, I learned from that. I mean, uh, experts disagree. I, I learned that there's no consensus in the industry. Um, but I also learned that a lot of the experts who disagreed with me in, in hindsight, I think disagreed with me because I criticized how they did stuff. Nobody likes a critic. And, you know, in hindsight, it's a whole lot easier to poke holes in somebody else's stuff than it is to propose something new and let other people poke holes in your stuff. And so that's what I tried to do in the second and the third book. And, you know, the feedback on the second book was it's very technical. It's very complicated. There's clearly a lot of good stuff here. Where do I use each of these? do i have to use all of this everywhere that that doesn't really make sense and so this is the the motive for the third book saying business decision makers have to decide how much to do and you know what's going to be different for a small shoe factory versus a high-speed passenger rail switching system um and so I, I i wanted to answer the 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 question that came out of the black book over and over again where do I use this? Because the black book, I went sort of to the other extreme. I just said documentary. I document what the world's most secure sites do differently. Leave it to the reader to figure out, well, so does 62443. So does 27. So does everything out there. So I wanted to sort of address that gap in the industry by saying, here's my best understanding of what you should do where and why. At a very high level. I mean, the book, mm -hmm. again, manager's guide i fly high and slow for most of the book well in your second book uh secure operations technology or sec otu and and i will say uh well well i had that comment on the first book i i think the second book from my point of view was extremely useful for showing a variety variety of different ways unidirectional technology could be used I, I thought that was extremely helpful if someone was saying, how could I use this? There were, I don't know if there were 20 some cases, but there were a lot of cases in there. But you you sort of tried to coin a term there, sec OT. I don't know that that term has really taken hold. Now, in your third book, I see you trying to sort of coin another term. Uh, the book is engineering grade OT security. So this engineering grade uh, is, is a big theme in the book you you talk about it being engineering grade design engineering grade detection or i'm sorry protection engineering grade ot security let's talk a little bit about engineering uh i i found one part of the book i actually was cheering when i read this uh you this is a quote in most jurisdictions the engineering profession has not yet come to grips with cyber risk to the public and to physical operations at this writing there's no jurisdiction in the world where failing to apply robust cyber risk management to industrial designs can cost an engineer her license to practice. And, and if I may, I just let, let me comment one thing on that. Sure. I've had that argument with professional engineers for the last 10 years, because you'll see professional engineers come in and deploy something with, let's say the legacy security model. If a company has legacy 
standard and high security model and they have secure deployment guides, I will see professional engineers, licensed engineers, deploy it with the least secure model. And I, I ask them, isn't this risking your license? And it depends who you ask. If you ask someone like Joel or Sinclair, they'll say, no, engineers don't do that. But I've seen so many engineers that do that, that I thought this was a really important point to bring out. Now, you wanted to clarify something on that. I did. Again, um, I've got to get you the uh, the the actual printed book. So let me let me take an action to do that after the after the, the recording here. Um, I, I recall changing that sentence. I can't swear that I changed it, but I recall wanting to change it. Um, I think what it says now is there's no jurisdiction in the world where an engineer has lost their license for failing to apply, blah, blah, blah. Um, because I've had many people correct me saying, no, no, I do. There's codes of ethics in a lot of engineering jurisdictions. You can look on the internet. You can find them. Cybersecurity is in there. There's a paragraph or two. Yeah. Um, and so it, at least in theory, is possible. I just never seen it happen. And so even though the problem seems to be recognized by the profession in theory, um, you know, to your point, I have seen lots of people. Now, I can't swear I've seen engineers, but I've seen lots of people look at something like the 62443 standard and say, hmm, I've got, I want to be compliant with the standard. So, um I need to pick a security level. Let's pick SL1, do SL1 across the board because, you know, I don't have nation states coming after me. Or, you know, pick SL2, pick something, do it across the board, not realizing that that standard was written to be cross industry. It was written to apply to small shoe factories as well as high speed rail switching systems. The standard has recently been interpreted for high speed rail switching systems by the, uh, who was it? Senelec in, in Europe. Uh, they came out with a technical report, uh, TS50701. And they actually said, you know, forget four levels. We need five levels. They've actually done a really good job of applying the standard to that high consequence industry. But most people say, well, you know, I guess I'll do SL2. Why? Well, because I don't know what else to do. And, you know, this is, I think, in my understanding, I'm watching this from a distance, you know, the, the drafting team for the refresh of 3-3, uh, 6244-3-3-3, the one with all the security controls in it that talks about the security levels. There's a vigorous debate going on saying, how do we define these security levels and what kind of advice can we give people when they're selecting security levels so that they're not making these mistakes that we see people making? deploying a shoe factory security program for a high-speed rail switching system. Yeah, I, I can appreciate the the change in language that you uh, put in the version, although the concept was the same. It was just whether it's actually been lost or could be lost, um, because I've had that same, as I said, I've had that argument with engineers, and some of them have said, no, 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 we're responsible for this, but I haven't seen it happen. And I, I think especially when I've even had engineers with the vendor designing the system, not following their own secure deployment guides. And to me, it's like, well, how can you say this is right now? We were able to get them. They said, no, we don't have to do it this way. And I said, your own company is telling you this is the right thing to do. And, and they were able to do it. So I found that very interesting. And, and if we look at kind of history, um, and this is where I've had conversations with, let's say, less strident professional engineers, they say, if you look at history, what typically happens is something bad happens because of an engineering mistake, and then it gets written into the code. And then if you do not follow that in the future, then you are held responsible and, and your license is at risk. So it, it might be like uh, regulations tend to lag incidents as well. We might be running into that. Uh, let's, let's stay on engineering just for a second and you, you can answer that too, but you, you wrote that, I hope this is right. The time has come for security engineering to become a recognized part of the engineering profession for designs where public safety is at risk. And what I was curious of, again, neither you nor I, nor I are professional engineers, I believe. Um, I know I'm not, 
Uh, I'm a fan of engineering, but I'm not an yes. engineer. Do you see, or when you talk to them, do you see security engineering being a separate professional engineering discipline, or do you see it as a field of study required to be a professional engineer in, in the various disciplines where you can be one today? Yeah. Um, again, I don't remember that sentence um, in hindsight. I mean, I've reread the book six times in the course of proofreading it since since you saw it. Um, to me, the sort of the clearest case for uh, new engineering practices, as opposed to, you know, most of, of, of what I describe as engineering grade or security engineering is applying existing practices systematically, universally mm -hmm. to address cyber risk as well as physical risk. You know, the, the classic example is a, a, a high, pre, you know, a, a six story boiler in a, a coal fired power plant. Um, mechanical valves, overpressure valves, pressure release valves are used to address the risk of the boiler blowing up in your face and killing everybody nearby in response to what kind of threat? In response to the threat of an earthquake crimping the outlet pipe and causing the boiler to overpressurize. You know, in response to a hurricane coming through and messing with the furnace and overheating the boiler and causing it again to, to overpressurize. These safety devices you in fact call them sorry uh consequence reduction devices these devices i think tell me if i got it right don't remember um oh oh yeah that's yeah i've used that i've used those examples for consequence reduction in the risk of there you go. Um, these devices are used routinely to address physical threats like earthquakes and hurricanes they should be used routinely, systematically to address cyber threats that can bring about those, those physical circumstances as well. So, but these are all old techniques. People have been doing overpressure valve. People have been doing safety engineering for like 70 years now. Um, to me, the, the, the clearest case for something new is tracking consequences. Um, because you know, one of the, the early exercises with cyber informed engineering that Idaho national labs carried out, um, they put a bunch of OT security people in the room. And I had the sense that, you know, these were from small electric utilities. Most of what they did was manage stuff like firewalls and, and uh, Active Directory. Um, they put them in the room, gave them a, a network diagram of a, a power distribution system and said, okay, you know, you've had some training on CIE, apply the methodology here. First step is to figure out what is the worst case consequence because worst case consequence determines what kind of security is necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, they looked at the network diagram, they couldn't figure out. They said, you know, I've heard of this possibility of a cascading outage, taking all the lights out in, in you know, a whole region of, of, of the grid. Is it possible that a cyber attack on this system could cause a cascading outage? I don't know. They didn't have any electrical engineers in the room. They they were not given a diagram of you know, that you know the engineer would need a diagram of the physical system and how it was interconnected with the rest of the grid. They weren't even you know on the I, I, I saw that the, the 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 network diagram they were given. They weren't even in the network diagram. It wasn't even called out where the protective relays were that prevent that kind of cascading outage. You know that that are tasked with preventing equipment damage. They just didn't, A, they didn't have the information, and B, even if they had the information, the wrong people were in the room. Who are the right people? You would need protection engineers. You would need electrical engineers. More generally, in a refinery, you need chemical engineers. You need automation engineers. You need a lot of knowledge in the room to figure out what is the worst case. Uh, and it's equally possible to overestimate the worst case and overdesign sure. your security system as it is to underestimate the worst case and underdesign your security system. Most people are blind to the possibility of equipment damage. But to me, you know, just like today, there's a whole specialization for evaluating and tracking safety consequences for changes in the design of a physical process or the automation for a physical process. That, to me, that new skill set is one where we need, we can't count on the right people coming into the room to figure this out after the fact. To me, this is something that the profession has to start tracking, just like they track safety from the very beginning. They need to track cyber 
consequence from the very beginning so that when someone asks the question, they have the answer instead of, you know, a blank piece of paper staring at them. Yeah, I mean, I would not expect that uh, someone in OT security would be able to do the things you talk about those people in the room to do. Um, I would not even attempt to train them to do those things to do. I, as you say, it's more about getting the right people in the room. And I guess, you know, when I've gone on my consequence riff, it's been that the engineers understand the consequence. They've under, they pretty much know the high consequence events already. And, and where we can help an OT is help them say, could a cyber incident degrade or actually disable what you have put in place to cause that high consequence event? Such as, uh, I'm sure you've run into cases where you go in, you'll say, what's the worst thing that can happen? And they'll say, oh, this thing could spin too fast or get too hot or, or something like that and, and cause a safety incident and damage equipment. And, but that can't happen because we've got our PLC programmed to prevent that from happening. And that's, that's where the OT person will say, well, you realize I can reprogram that. And then, then you go that next step. So I, I think, I think that it's one of the things that I think is an accomplishment over the last five years via CCE and a variety of other people banging on the drum uh, that we're starting to look at that. Uh, let's dive into engineering grade design. Okay, yeah, you want to say let something me, on that? Let me, let me add. Let me add just to the end of that. You know, you you said you know the engineers understand that. Um, my point is that um, the engineers are not one person. It's not even one specialty. It's sure. in a, in a large organization, the knowledge is spread out across a ridiculous number of people who have focused and specialized and hardly even talk to each other. The protection engineers might not be on site. They might, you know, they they come in there, do their thing. And they leave and they take the knowledge with them. And so what I'm suggesting in the book, right or wrong, is that tracking consequence and what's possible and what's not is, you know, has too many specialties, too many specialties involved, too many people, physical people involved, too many organizations involved. Half the time, the people involved work for somebody else. They're not there as part of your organization. Bringing them into the room is really hard. And so what I'm suggesting is that just like the engineering profession documents as built designs, just like they document safety cases, just like they review the safety stuff on an annual basis, they bring people into the room to review. We need to build up that body of knowledge on consequence and maintain it routinely as opposed to assume that we can bring everyone in the room and reinvent the knowledge. I don't think we can do that. I think that we need to track it. But I don't know if that's a... a a subtlety worth going into. Well, I, I think you reference one way of doing that in the cyber PHA in the book is is one method of you know extending a PHA to consider could a a cyber incident cause something cause a high consequence event that you thought you had dealt with. And there's there's other ones that are mentioned in the book. Again, I, I think you hit most of the big ones that are out there in a in a few pages in the book for people to consider. But let's let's really dive into it. So the title of the book, Engineering Grade OT Security by Andrew Ginter, available where all fine books are sold. Uh, you you use this term engineering grade. So why don't you define what makes something an engine engineering grade design? Sure. Uh, so um, you use the word design. I use the word the, the adjective a little more generally engineering grade okay. solutions are you know components um mitigations are those that are deterministic they behave the same way all the time in a sense give or take equipment failures um and you know can be modeled mathematically the failure rate can be modeled mathematically reliably um you know i argue against i argue that uh modeling cyber risk as uh, consequence times likelihood muddies the waters. Um, likelihood, you know, you, well, what you go, what's wrong with that? Well, consequence times likelihood actually makes sense in the safety world because you can mathematically model the likelihood of a piece of safety equipment failing. The problem with cyber attacks is that they're deliberate, they're not accidental, and, you know, they don't occur randomly. And 
they're deterministic. But in, in a sense, that's a different topic. So those are the, the, the two pieces, you know, deterministic and you know, mathematically modelable or modelable, reliably modelable, as opposed to, you know, murky uh, likelihood stuff. Um, the classic example is the overpressure valve, uh, you know, and uh, I love the SPR books, uh, you know, uh, security PHA review. Um, and aside, I hope, I can only hope <laughs> that, that, you know, at least some readers will see my book as, as you know, being as useful as security page review, you know, security page review is much more technical than mine. It, Mm -hmm. But the thing I loved about the book was before I read the book, I had no idea how to do that stuff. And afterwards, I looked at back, I closed the book and I said, well, that's obvious. Why haven't we been doing it like this for 20 years? This is obviously the right way to do it. To me, that's the, it's a brilliantly written book because before you read it, you don't know. And after you read it, of course, it's the right way to do things. It's just there, there's no argument. So. That was my goal here. I don't know if I've achieved it. You can tell me if, if there's still argument left in your mind. But well, I think, way... yeah, I, I think I had the same experience. I I participated in um, security PHA. Um, I don't know how many years ago, quite a few years ago for a large pipeline organization. And it, I had the same sort of thing. It was eye opening. It was like, oh, you know, it. why shouldn't, why aren't we doing this? It's why I've been pointing out this, Dunning-Kruger curve, you know, where you have high confidence with low knowledge and you're at this peak. And I, you know, I, I see so much of that in my career. I was sure before that, that we were doing it right. And then I see this other approach that is so obviously important and effective. I think the importance is you can always argue about, but the effectiveness of it, of just getting rid of those consequences. Um, and, and stripping them out is, is something that we have a much harder time uh, with the likelihood side, whether you call it likelihood or you break it down into various components. Um, I, I agree completely with you there. In your book, you you had a you had a lot of examples um, like the pressure relief valve and such that yeah. would be unhackable consequence preventive measures. But then you had one one flip side on that. And I'll, let, I'll let you get to that. You you included unidirectional one way devices as something that was engineering grade, and that was kind of a I'd almost put it like in a different category. That was that was really more classic per, preventing attacks as opposed to preventing the consequence of attacks. But there was only that one. Now clearly, waterfall security is the leader in that field. Has been for decades. Um, so it wasn't a total surprise, but it, it did seem to be a, a twist on it. You would call, you would call unidirectional engineering grade as well. Uh, engineering grade unidirectionality. But if I may, let me, let me come to that. Uh, I got distracted. I want to answer the question about engineering grade just a little bit more thoroughly. Okay. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let me give, you know, we've talked about the, the overpressure valve as, as engineering grade protection for, you know, the prevention of a, the, the explosion of a boiler. Um, let me give an example that's not engineering grade. Um, we all remember, I hope, the 1940-ish uh, Tacoma Narrows disaster, one of the world's largest, you know, first large uh, suspension bridges, harmonic frequency, a stiff breeze came along, the bridge started oscillating at the harmonic frequency and, you know, tore itself to pieces. Um, talked the engineering profession about harmonic frequencies. Imagine... You know, here's here's the opposite of engineering grade. Imagine that um, the engineering profession has figured out, I don't know, carbon fibers or something, has figured out how to build suspension bridges at one third the price, one third the cost of today's suspension bridges. You know, massive savings. The problem with the new design is that it's riddled, absolutely riddled with harmonic frequencies. People walking across the bridge is enough to start it oscillating. And so the profession has incorporated active hydraulic vibration dampers into the structure of the bridge. Uh, computer controlled, AI controls the computer, you know, massively redundant, multiply redundant power supplies. The bridge feels rock solid when you're using it because of these active dampers. How happy would you be driving across that bridge every day on the way to work if you knew that the design engineer hoped 
that if there was a cyber attack on the AI controlling the dampers, hoped that we could detect the attack before it crippled the AI. How happy would you be using that bridge if you knew the design engineer hoped that if we detected the attack in time, that uh, we could scramble an incident response team fast enough to prevent disaster? Hope is not what we expect of the engineering profession. We expect a bridge that's designed. We expect it to carry a specified load in a specified operating environment for a specified number of decades with a large margin for error. I mean, I talked to an engineer who designs pedestrian bridges. I said, the bridge over here by my, my, my home, uh, a large pedestrian bridge from a football stadium over to uh, you know a residential area where most people park because they don't want to pay the, the price of the, the parking lot. When the game lets out, that bridge is shoulder to shoulder people. I said, how do you model, how do you know how much load to build that bridge for? He said, Andrew, it's easy. You know, there's barriers on either end of the bridge. You cannot drive a vehicle onto the bridge. And so, you know, most people are less than two meters tall, six foot six. Um, most people are mostly water. You model, you know, two meters of water, the width of the bridge, the length of the bridge, that's your maximum load, they said. And then you multiply that by eight because these are people. Failure of the bridge under load is unacceptable. That's what we expect. We expect that when there are public safety threats, we expect the automation systems, we know when, when, when there are cyber threats to public safety, we expect the engineering profession to deliver a system that will carry the threat load that's expected um, for at least as long as the next opportunity to upgrade the security system with a large margin for error. That's what we expect of the profession. To me, that's the goal for engineering grade. And you know, we can switch gears to, to unidirectional if you want, but because you know that that's really talking about network engineering, an element of an engineering grade solution, one element of the of the solution. Yeah, I don't we we probably need to move on. I I would I would quibble a bit is this is an interview, not a debate, with your dampening example. I think your second example is probably probably stronger um, in in my mind. But why don't we why don't we move into unidirectional? Because again, that you had all these things that said. I said, okay, I understand the term engineering grade for these things because they were primarily engineering based solutions to the problem, not not security solutions, but they were a better way to engineer failure out of the system. In, in all sorts of environmental and, and human efforts. But but the unidirectional was was the one, I guess what I would call security control was in there. So how does that one pass the test? Um, so a couple of things. One is, you know, when the overpressure valve engages, what happens? Nothing blows up and we shut the power plant down because this is never supposed to happen. This was a last ditch safety engaging. We shut the power plant down and we analyze what just happened here because this is unacceptable. This must never happen again. Um, here's the thing. A large power plant is critical infrastructure. It's critical to national security. That's the legal definition of critical when people have legally defined what is critical infrastructure. It's critical to the nation. And so if we want to prevent both the safety outcome and the plant shut down, we need to prevent the cyber attack getting into the thing in the first place. And this is where I coined the phrase network engineering. And I put a chapter together talking about different mm -hmm. engineering tools to prevent the propagation of cyber attacks from outside networks, from the internet, bluntly, into networks whose worst case consequence of compromise are unacceptable. And I position the unidirectional gateway as one way of doing it. It's, unidire it's, it's engineering grade unidirectionality. N the good unidirectional gateways are like that. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, there's all sorts of stuff out there on the market. You, you know, buyer beware. But you know, if you physically de design the thing, the the gold standard in the industry is optical isolation. Uh, you know, laser on one circuit board, photocell on the other, short piece of fiber. So I position it as engineering grade unidirectionality, engineering grade prevention of attacks passing through the device into the protected network. And so if and, and you know, I position 
all of network engineering, all of the techniques, the analog signaling, the unidirectional gateways, the, you know, even the EPRIA methodology is talking about consequence boundaries. You don't apply unidirectional, sorry, you don't apply network engineering universally. You apply those techniques at boundaries between networks with dramatically different worst case consequences. And, you know, most commonly, it's the boundary between IT and OT. Now, you could argue, no, no, it should be the boundary between OT and the safety system. You could argue that. In practice, that's not what people do. And I, you know, I go into some detail explaining why that's not what people do. But the point is that, that it doesn't matter how you define your high-consequence network. It doesn't matter where you draw the line, provided that all of the critical stuff is in, inside the line. Once you you know put all the critical stuff inside the line, you can move the line around uh, depending on uh, your business needs. Provided you've protected the critical stuff, you can apply network engineering where it costs you the least and still buys you the needed protection. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm with you on the unidirectional outbound. I am. I am one of those people that says it should go between the SIS and the and the control system. I, I always push for that, either that or DPI for read only. But so I understand the outbound. You could say that's engineering grade because it's deterministic. Nothing's coming in from the outside, you know, unless it's walked around and you do cover USBs and contractor laptops and that in the book. But I, I wouldn't see how unidirectional inbound could be engineering grade. Do you, do you view that as engineering grade as well? I, bluntly, I do not. Um, I don't see anything. I mean, it's engineering grade um, only in the sense that uh, you, you know, to the degree that you've defined the, the threat that you're addressing. You know, in the worst case, in the worst case, any information leaking back in can be part of a cyber attack. The, the theoretical worst case is cooperating malware. You've got malware on the inside already. You've got malware on the outside, and now they're trying to communicate because you want to give the bad guys remote control of what's happening inside. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got any information leaking back in, I don't care if it's analog signaling, I don't care if it's, you know, coming in through people's brains and being typed into the into the computer on the inside um, in theory it's you know it's mathematically always possible to uh, steganographically encode attack information into that data flow um, you might encode it into the low order bits of analog values you might encode it into the timing gaps between messages and so on um, and this is where chapter six comes in, talking about your design basis threat. You've got to, nothing is ever completely free of risk. Uh, you, there's always risk that you must accept. And the key question in seven, in chapter seven and eight is answering the question, what is reasonable? But in chapter six, we talk about how can you define cyber risk in a much more defensible way, rather than waving your hands and saying likelihood. Um, when in fact there's, you know, deliberate attacks don't behave probabilistically, they behave deterministically. Um, and so, no, um, if you have to leak something back in and you always do, there's always residual risk. And the question becomes how much and how can we apply an engineering mindset into modeling the risk? because it, rather than, than trying to eliminate entirely. It, one of the first things I say in the book, in, in the chapter, I can't remember which chapter, um, is look, the goal of risk management pretty much everywhere is not to eliminate all risk. A, that's almost never possible. Yeah, yeah. And B, if that were the goal, you could take your investor's money and throw it in the government bonds and be done with it. You know, the goal is to take reasonable risks when they're necessary to the mission of the organization. And so the question is, the key question is, what is reasonable? Um, and so, yeah, it's, people might imagine that engineering grade means absolute. It does not. It means reasonable. And so in that sense, if you define the risk profile correctly, yes, I, I suggest unidirectional gateways are engineering grade, though 
you know, I try to dumb it down for managers. I try to keep it simple. If you want to take it to an extreme, you could argue, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to go there. You, you could argue, you could argue that, that engineering grade also applies to small shoe factories and that the engineering study says, all I need here is IT. Therefore, the IT solution in small shoe factories, that's really all you need there is engineering grade because an engineer has done the risk analysis. If you take it to extremes, nothing means anything anymore. So, you know, mm -hmm. I coined the phrase to try and apply uh, a different way of thinking to high consequence networks, not small shoe factories. Um, okay. Well, let's let's um, let's try to hit one more topic here. Um, people can read that, and and I think that 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 switch though is really an important part of the book where you're talking about the uh, consequence reduction activities is, is and, one thing. And, and then the, and then the saying, okay, is, is unidirectional engineering grade and, and why is it engineering grade as opposed to other security controls? It's, it's two, I think in, in my mind, two very different thought paths on that related, but different. Um, and, and I, I'd encourage the readers to look at that. It's, it's an interesting uh, approach to try to get your head on and see if it, it fits for you. Um, can we, can we hit, um, it, this is a little bit of a diversion, but I know you're, you're up on this cause I've seen you present on it. I'm a huge fan of ICS strive and the waterfall security solutions report, where you look at incidents that public public incidents that have it had an effect. Let me try that again. Cyber incidents that have publicized that have had an effect on physical operations. Yes. Uh, and, and the data is pretty overwhelming in 2022 and even more so in 2021 that ransomware on the IT network has been what has caused most physical impacts in OT because they don't have the shipping information, the ordering information. They're afraid of cross compromise for a variety of reasons, but, we see that. I don't think we've heard yet if Clorox was officially ransomware, but we're, you know we see another example there. We've seen numerous ones of them. I, I wonder, it, it is a little bit related when you talk about engineering grade OT security in your new book. Should we be spending our time and money on that in 2023, or should we be spending our time and money trying to reduce ransomware and IT affecting our operations. Where's a better place for us to spend our money in 2023? Um, that's, I mean, that's, that's the, the question for the ages. Um, the, and, but in a sense, in a sense, it's an artificial question. Um, we need to solve the problem. Um, and there's there's two ways of looking at the problem. One way is looking forward and one way is looking backward. The threat report, I'm sorry, looks backward. It's looking at what happened mm -hmm. in the last tense. Um, and I would I worry too much you know about looking backward and spending a lot of money to solve yesterday's problem. Um, the point that I make in the book is that, it's not enough to look at what happened last year, put a Band-Aid on our systems, and say, there, we're done. That's not the expectation of the engineering profession when public safety is at risk. Now, if there's no public safety threats for you know small shoe factories or toaster factories, um, go wild. You know, uh, My advice is ask your insurance company, you know, buy insurance to cover you in the case of a cyber attack, Ask them what you have to do. Do that and then some so that the insurance company can't point the finger and you say you, you didn't do what you promised. And you're good. Um, the uh, But when public safety is at risk, looking forward, the profession has an obligation to protect public safety to a reasonable standard. And, you know, the word reasonable is something that's debated in courts, it's debated in ethics committees. You know, due care is a fancy legal word of uh, legal phrase meaning doing what any reasonable person would do. And so, 
looking at the possibility that you know cyber attacks come across the internet, they get into IT, they have got into OT, uh, you know, less often uh, than they get into IT. Um, they could do all sorts of really nasty stuff there, but you know, historically that's happened very rarely. Um, so I don't need to do anything. That's that's not to me. That's not reasonable. And the question is, what is what are the court's expectations? What are society's expectations? If there's a jury of your peers, you know, if if there is an unreasonable incident, and you are ask did you put reasonable protections in place looking back saying you know last year all the attacks were on it networks so that's what i put my money into and i didn't really worry about public safety that's not the right answer and you know to me uh we have obligations we need to understand those obligations as looking forward if that exponential curve keeps going you know that's i'm sorry that's a that's a crisis coming down the tracks at us. If those numbers continue, you know, with by 2027, 2028, less than five years from now, we're, we're in the middle of a crisis. There's going to be attacks on IT networks taking OT down. There's going to be attacks going through IT networks taking OT down. Um, I do not believe that in the next five years we can build a cybersecurity wall that is big enough or strong enough. I don't believe we can build it fast enough to stop that train coming down the tracks. I think we need to get off the tracks. And that's the point I'm making in the book. The engineering approach gives us a way to step off the tracks. You call it consequence reduction. I, you know, consequence reduction won't help you for critical infrastructures. It won't help you for reliability impacts. I try to broaden engineering grade to mean consequence reduction for safety and or national security for reliability. And I believe that approach looking forward is what we need. And I've had I've had feedback on the book from other experts. You know, one piece of feedback was Andrew, uh, I forget the name of it, but the latest report from Dragos is the, the I think it was a threat report. One of the latest Dragos reports is the most important work that's come out in the field so far. And it's very different from mine. It's focused on incident response. I believe, if I recall correctly, the number one you know, recommendation there was we must develop a robust incident response capability in all situations where cyber compromises is unacceptable. And they're right. We also need that. Okay. It, cyber informed engineering is not a coin where you can say, let's do some cyber security this year, because that's what we saw hitting us last year. You know, and maybe in the future we'll do some engineering. We need the whole coin. Yes, we need engineering grade protections for safety. Yes, we need what I have described as network engineering, engineering grade prevention of cyber attacks crippling uh, critical infrastructures. Yes, we need IT security. We especially need incident response capabilities because nothing is ever completely secure. And this was a, a point that slipped my mind earlier. You know, when we talk engineering grade safety, forget cyber, just safety. No, no refinery is perfectly safe. You run the math and you say, with these safeties in place, we would expect to see a fatality once a century. Spend more money. Well, we can expect a fatality once every three centuries. Spend even more money. You cannot take it down to zero. And so there's always risk that you have to accept. The question is, what is reasonable? But that analysis, that approach, that kind of thinking is what I suggest we need on the engineering side. In addition to the incident response capabilities, we need the whole thing. What do we spend money on first is a good question, but it's not the most important question. The most important question to me is what's the goal? How do we describe the end state? And how can we start taking concrete steps towards getting to that end state as quickly as possible? Okay. I just two quick comments on that. One is I, I agree with you on the goal, but then once I have the goal, I want to prioritize my actions. <laughs> so you you do kind of end up back at the first first question. Um and, and I would say that uh when I talk consequence reduction, a large part of that is recovery. So uh, you know, having a recovery time objective that can be met and is viewed as acceptable. In fact, if I were I, I wrote an article, if I were 
king of the world and could put any regulation in place for critical infrastructure, I would have them provide an RTO for approval and have them prove that they can meet that RTO in the event of a cyber incident. And then how they do that, I don't really care, you know, because I don't care what security controls they care they have in place. I just want to know that drinkable water can be available within 48 hours or something of that nature. Um, but let's, I have, I have one last question for you, and this, this might be a fun one in the book. And, and maybe you took this out, but at the very end, you hinted at retirement in your end notes that you might not have another book in you. This might be it. And you're kind of see retirement coming down the road. I'm not going to ask you when you retire, but what keeps you working now? What is it that you enjoy that says, you know, I could retire, but I, I want to keep working because I like doing this. I love doing stuff. I mean, and, you know, this is a, a, a worthwhile goal. This is, you know, the, the making the world a safer place is, is worth doing. Uh, you know, personally, you know, I had this conversation with my wife a few years ago. Um, you know, Andrew, when are you going to retire? I don't know. Um, Here's a simpler question. What are you going to do when you retire? I said, well, I'll, uh, I'll probably take some courses on neural networks and I'll, I'll, I'll write some code. I'll tinker with stuff. I'll, I'll uh, you know, see if there's, uh, there's uh, something useful I can do in that, in that space. She says, so when you retire, you're going to work. And I'm going, <laughs> yeah. She says, so uh, don't retire. And I'm going, I'm good with that. The conclusion back then was, you know, I'd like to keep going till I'm, I don't know, 75, another decade or more. Um, well, then reality hit me. And, uh, you know, I don't know about, about you guys. I don't know why the human body works in round numbers of decades. But, you know, the the uh, your body peaks at around age 25 and then starts a long, slow decline. Well, you know, and there are occasional sudden drops. And one of them, I'm told, you should expect around age 60. Well, I hit age 60, and I went, ah. And I'm going, on this trajectory, I'm not going to make it to age 65, much less. <laughs> and then it leveled out. And I'm going, oh, God. <laughs> All sorts of problems. You know, I was in for my heart. I was in for my eyes. I was in for my arthritis. I, and so, I don't know. I hit another one of those. I might not be around, but I would like to be around for a while. So, you know, this is, uh, this is a job worth doing. This is something that, uh, that I want to do. And, you know, I will probably stick around as, as long as, uh, as I think I'm adding some value. Okay. Well, that's a great answer, Andrew. I appreciate uh, the candor. So do you have that book behind you? Do you have engineering grade? I do. Hold up the and book. But engineering and, grade OT security uh, yes, by yeah. Andrew Ginter. It's uh, it's it's definitely worth a read. I I agree with some of your reviewers. I think it's the best of your three books. I think it's the most accessible, accessible, easy to understand, and I I think it will have the biggest impact. So congratulations on that, Andrew. Well, thank you, sir. And for the record, um, you know, in celebration of the launch, it is still available for free from Waterfall. Go to waterfall-security.com slash engineering-grade-ot-security, and you can request your own copy. We'll include that link in the show notes. Thanks for being on the show, Andrew. Thank you.